there's no easy way to grow adoption. You either have to pay people, which is unsustainable, or you have to genuinely have something that's unique, useful, and uh, safe. The thing we're trying to do with Frax is that if we can solve the stablecoin trilemma, that is actually something that's that's useful, right? Uh, that's actually something that is non-custodial, it's stable, and there's there's no risk of blacklisting and it's fully uh, entirely yours if you own it, right? There's clear value proposition over USDC and, and Tether, and but also something that is used and, and able to get you yield in places on chain, right? Not something mm -hmm. crazy. Hello everyone, my name is Ben and as usual, I'm the host of today's podcast. Today we have Sam Kazimian, the founder of Frax Finance. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hey, it's uh, good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Sam. So before we get started, I generally like to ask uh, our guests on the show, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into crypto and, you know, yeah, the usual. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've, I've been in crypto for a while now, um, around 2013. Uh, I was a student at UCLA and I heard about Bitcoin and uh, mining back then. Um, mm -hmm. And I got into researching crypto and getting into mining proof of work coins like Bitcoin. And back then the, the script coins like Litecoin, uh, Dogecoin was one of the earliest Dogecoin uh, mm -hmm. miners that afterwards. Uh, after college, started my first uh, company named Everpedia. It's a decentralized version of Wikipedia. It's like Wikipedia on the blockchain. And um, that is going well. And in 2019, uh, I started to think about where I think the stablecoin space and, and crypto is going as a whole. Uh, that was back before DeFi was a real term or like people really were talking about mm -hmm centralized finance, but I started to get really into stable coins and uh, the different types of stable coins. And back then it was just, you know, MakerDAO and the fiat coins, right? Um, mm -hmm. People were talking about some, you know, algorithmic designs and, and things like that. Um, that's where Frax was born and uh, started Frax in uh, 2019. And we released the first version in late 2020. Uh, Frax currently is the number fifth largest stable coin by market cap. And um, it's one of the largest DeFi protocols. It makes uh, mm -hmm. a lot of revenue per year. I think just about $80 million uh, of revenue uh, annually. Wow. And it's going really well. There's a slew of uh, different uh, protocol infrastructure products like FraxSwap and FraxLand, which we'll talk about soon and uh overall things are going uh really great and uh excited to talk about them yeah awesome right so like you've mentioned frax finance is uh primarily first a stablecoin protocol um and you know the question everyone mind today is you know about algorithmic stable coins decentralized stable coins are they safe all that kind of things we, we actually a couple of weeks back had justin sun as well talking about USDD and you know we're curious to learn about the other uh, models in the space and you know one of, the one of the projects he mentioned that he modeled his after as well is a little bit is on Frax Finance so if you could explain how does Frax Finance work and how does it ensure that it's 
peg remains at one US dollar. Yeah, definitely. So um, that's uh, that's cool that there's uh, others uh, like like Justin said that you know USD is inspired by uh, Frax. Frax actually is the first kind of fractional stablecoin, which kind of is a uh, modeled after fractional reserve banking, which is like the, the classical kind of uh, banking that that or the traditional financial system works on. The name Frax is uh, mm -hmm. you know combination of the words fractional algorithmic uh, stablecoin and the idea behind it even back in 2019 when we started is that we didn't think uh, algorithmic stablecoins like the original ideas like basis uh, and and like Terra what would become Terra I, I don't think it really was was going very uh, big back then we didn't think any of that stuff would work without exogenous collateral the whole point of frax is that it's uh, heavily backed by uh, exogenous collateral and does um, market operations using smart contracts. It's not backed by only this this other governance token. You know, for us, it's the FXS token called Frax mm -hmm. Shares. The idea behind Frax is that it's a it's a hybrid of the um, best of essentially both worlds to get both this. Um, security of, of the peg. Frax has actually never lost its peg, which we're really proud of, and also uh, capital efficiency and usability. And so uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the stablecoin trilemma, which is um, mm -hmm. actually something I like to bring up because it's uh, kind of similar to the blockchain scaling trilemma, but it's the, the stablecoin trilemma, which means that uh, stablecoins are fighting to achieve uh, all three of these things, peg stability, decentralization in like collateral, uh, and, and, and basically capital efficiency. Those are the three pieces of the, the triangle, but it seems so far that you can only have two of them. You always have to yeah. kind of give up uh, one of them. And this the, the name of this stablecoin trilemma comes from Vitalik's blockchain scaling trilemma, which uh, he mm -hmm. likes to uh, explain is like, you know, blockchains, they uh, almost always want all three things of scalability, throughput, and like decentralization, but you always kind of have to give up one or there seems to be this kind of natural uh, barrier to being able to perfectly get all three. And the stable point trilemma basically says like, uh, there if you do two of the things, then one of the uh, last pieces of the triangle is, is basically uh, not able to be cheap. For example, if you have decentralized collateral and um, and uh, you have a, a good peg, essentially that means that you can't scale the, the money supply. For example, uh, LUSD. LUSD is purely decentralized collateral. It's over collateralized ETH. Um, it stays relatively stable around a dollar. Um, but LUSD supply can't grow. If more people want LUSD, the only thing you can do is uh, over collateralize ETH with it. And so there just is not enough LUSD uh, when yeah. people want a really decentralized, um, a, you know, pegged asset. So it gives up the capital efficiency of, of money creation, right? And then you you might have something uh, like, you know, Terra, right? Which is is technically... Uh, backed by collateral uh, of its own governance token. And uh, it's mm -hmm. super capital efficient because you can mint it uh, out of thin air, but then it gives up the peg stability, right? Sometimes it's mm -hmm. a dollar and other times it implodes and everyone loses uh, their money, right? And, um, you know, you can think of this kind of trilemma as it's, it's hard to get all three. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and, and we think personally that the Frax has the best performance out of any stable coin that exists and has existed on this stable coin uh, trilemma, which means it's kept its perfect peg. Um, it it is decentralized uh, as as much as possible. Now we'll we'll get into some of the yep. collateral. There is some exposure to USDC, uh, and that is a concern that a lot of people have for Frax. But it is a fully non custodial. Uh, stable coin. There's no blacklist. There's absolutely nothing. There's no way for any one or any entity or anything to, you mm -hmm. know, uh, take possession of a frac stable coin. It's, it's decentralized in that way. 
And uh, obviously, Fract is very scalable and capital efficient because it's a fractional algorithm so that when there's a lot of demand for uh, stable currency, uh, it actually can expand in supply in uh, protocol and liquidity pools in lending markets and all of these places to actually give people uh, access to a decentralized currency that they want to hold. So in short, I think that a, a fractional kind of hybrid system captures and solves uh, all three uh, desirability properties of, of the stablecoin trilemma. And uh, so far, it seems like that's true. And it's, you know, Frax is growing in one of the fastest uh, stablecoins, number five right now on uh, mm -hmm. CoinGecko's own rankings. I like to look at the, the stablecoin ranking, but <laughs> CoinGecko, that's how, uh, that's, that's what I check every day. Cool. And, you know, we obviously talked a lot about Terra because it was one of the biggest uh, events that happened in crypto ever, I would say, like one of the biggest black swan events. And obviously this has brought a lot of uh, heat on the stablecoin ecosystem and the industry as a whole. You know, how, how has this affected uh, Frax? You know, you mentioned Frax model for success has been very successful so far, uh, but has this affected, you know, the state, the point of view of, you know, the regulators on the stablecoin market and, you know, where's the industry heading after this terror fall? Yeah, I, I'm generally optimistic about regulations, um, mm -hmm. and, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. However, um, I think that basically the decentralized stablecoin space right now is dominated by DAI and then Frax as, as the two mm -hmm. largest ones. There's a lot of other ones that are up and coming and interesting. Like you guys had Justin Sun talk about USDT the other day. There's smaller stable coins that bring unique things to the table like LUSD, which is like fully, yep. fully decentralized in every piece of collateral and, and things like that. Um, there's unique stable coins like Rai that aren't pegged to the US dollar mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, our second stable coin called the FPI, the Frax price index that is also not pegged to the US dollar. So I think the stable coin space will probably end up being one of the most innovative and interesting uh, you know, up and coming spaces in the next six to 12 months in crypto. It's probably one of the both most lucrative, but also most technologically interesting. In terms of regulation, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, as stable coins become more important, that they'll they'll most likely be, you know, regulated by the US and and uh you know mm -hmm. Europe and in in Asia. I particularly think that personally, um the reason I'm optimistic with regulations, like I I think barring any country just outright banning stable coins or something. Uh, I or or sanctioning them or whatever, I think Frax and and like MakerDAO and and stuff already comply with any type of possible uh, disclosure laws and and like regulatory mm -hmm. requirements that that could be imposed, right? Because we're entirely deterministic on chain. You can see the exact uh, collateral. Like Frax doesn't have relationships with market makers. It doesn't do anything off of the blockchain. You know, neither does MakerDAO, right? Everything you can see the collateral and the loans and and everything that's outstanding at all times. It's like a, it's almost like a, a disclosure every 15 seconds when there's a new mm -hmm. uh, block added to the Ethereum blockchain. So um, the reason I'm particularly you know optimistic is unless there's just an outright ban or sanctioning of of like stable coins, which I I don't think there there will be. Um, we personally, and me as a, as like a software developer in the stable coin space, don't really mind any kind of disclosure requirements. In fact, I think it would be a helpful thing for, for fiat coins to have disclosure requirements, uh, you know, codified in the law. And I think Frax would be in compliance of those as soon as they're in, you know, codified in legally. So like, I, I'm pretty optimistic when it comes to regulations. Very insightful because I think for many of us, we all we hear are fun, right? That it's good to have a, I guess, more balanced perspective from one of the founders of stablecoin, of the decentralized stablecoin, because you know it, it it can get quite tiring when we hear all sorts of news in because bad news makes good headlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, uh, I think it's like basically 
uh, just a lot of people that might not understand, like most of this stuff is, is basically just noise. Right. And, and mm -hmm. so unless there's an actual active effort to like ban stable coin technology, it's not like it's just going to, you know, go away. Right. People mm -hmm. actually find stable coins useful. They're one of the few things in crypto that has indisputable value proposition you know some people could yeah. argue well what, what why are nfts worth so much why is that a picture of you know a monkey worth like two hundred thousand yeah. dollars or whatever um that's fine people can argue about that but no one can argue about how useful uh being able to settle stable value like dollars and and things are yeah. on chain right so i'm i'm actually pretty optimistic stable coins mm -hmm. because there's no discussion about there's the, the, the cat's out of the bag right it's like everyone knows this is a very useful thing the question yep. is just how uh, it will end up uh, being a part of the industry, not if. Correct. Definitely agree. Okay. You mentioned a few minutes ago about, you know, a couple of projects and how Frax is actually an infrastructure play on the stablecoin industry, right? It's not just a stablecoin. There are also other products that you have. Uh, you mentioned a Frax price index, but I'm also aware that you actually have Frax Land and Frax Swap. You know, could you talk a little bit more about what these products are? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Frax obviously uh started out as just a, a dollar pegged stable coin, right? The the Frax stable coin, it's pegged to one dollar. And the mechanisms for it were like these fractional systems of controlling liquidity and and AMMs and minting and redeeming Frax. And um, Frax is so big now that it actually has its own AMM called Frax Swap, and we actually just launched the other week uh, its own um, internal lending market called Frax Lend. And this is pretty important because the whole vision for for Frax is not just to build a bunch of you know fun products or something. The vision I like to call is is the the Trinity, and mm -hmm. uh, the the point of the Trinity is that I personally think that the entire DeFi stack is composed of, in general terms, a uh, lending market and, you know, debt origination facility, right? Things like maker CDPs or like compound finance or Aave or like Fraxland and liquidity AMMs, right? Things like Curve, Uniswap or like Fraxwap, right? Yep. And then third is stable coins, right? A, a liquid, useful and, and widely circulating unit of account uh, like, like Frax, right? And these three things I call the Trinity because my personal belief is that they are the same product. They're, they're a financial mm -hmm. economic stack. And as one piece of them, whether you start out as a lending market or as a stable coin or as an AMM, uh, gets bigger in order to capture more market share in DeFi, that project or that DAO will definitely branch over into the other two things to capture uh, the other two pieces that, that it lacks. No one, uh, no, no project that I know of, at least today, has all three pieces of the Trinity other than Frax, because we actually just launched Fraxland uh, two, two weeks ago. But if you think about it, um, MakerDAO has two, right? They have the ability to do internal lending, right? To uh, mm -hmm. over collateralize and mint DAI. So they basically have kind of a rudimentary lending market. They obviously have the DAI stablecoin, which is the fourth largest stablecoin uh, in the world. So they definitely have two. They don't really have an AMM other than kind of the hand-coded PSM uh, swaps, but I think they will try to uh, more and more think about that market, which basically uh, proves that the kind of the Trinity vision that I have is, is probably correct, right? If you look at mm -hmm. stuff like Ave's new uh, Go stablecoin, right? Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, Ave came out and and made a pretty big announcement saying they're working on a stablecoin, and that stablecoin is the native stablecoin to the Ave lending market, right? And so you can see that Ave is trying to capture now the stablecoin part of the Trinity, and they obviously have the lending part of the Trinity, right? Um, they haven't really thought about the AMM or the swap side. I think they're a little bit far out from there, right? They still have to at least get like the second piece. Um, but if you think about it, I'm I'm confident that if their stablecoin goes well, they will be thinking about how to capture the, the swap and on-chain liquidity market. And uh, from the other side of the Trinity, 
Curve is the second largest DEX, right? Um, and they recently announced CRV USD, which is Curve's uh, native stablecoin, right? And so Curve starts out as an AMM, and in order to capture more market share in the uh, DeFi financial stack, right, they basically are also moving towards issuing their own stablecoin, which is the second part of the Trinity. And I think if their CRV USD stablecoin goes well, uh, they will think about lending and leverage and how to provide uh, debt denominated in CRV USD internally in the you know Curve protocol. And uh, you know might be still a little early for them to think about that. They have to first release their stablecoin, but that also proves uh, in my opinion, that everyone, whether they know it or admit it or, or like to talk about it, they're moving towards this Trinity view that everything in DeFi is this Trinity stack of lending, liquidity, and stable coins. These are the same thing. They're not different products. Um, and so that's why Frax has Frax Lend and Frax Swap as the, you know, and obviously the Frax stable coin as the full kind of uh, trifecta of the whole, whole DeFi stack. So as any part of Frax grows, we're able to capture the entire financial stack in one protocol. And I think that's very powerful because that's the end state of DeFi. The end state of DeFi mm -hmm. is basically creating a full financial digital economy. And uh, I think we're hopefully, and by the looks of it so far, uh, in the lead there. And um, I think a lot more projects will be thinking about how to uh, do that. You know, it's interesting because whenever I try to explain to people who don't really understand crypto, I, you know, when I, I mention Aave, I say, okay, it's a crypto pack. Just think of it like a pack. I'm borrowing something. Uh, would you say that this Trinity, the Holy Trinity of uh, DeFi, would you say they are becoming more analogous to actual banks? where the kind of products and services offered, you know, it's crypto banking, but for DeFi, like for real. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's the right way to think about it, right? It's, a, it's the full financial stack. In fact, I had someone explain it to me that it's, um, it's basically like uh, the stack that you have as a central bank, right? Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, the Fed is able to print money, right? They're, they do a lot of, uh repo purchase uh agreements for for bonds right so that's almost like uh the liquidity they provide yeah. that's like, kind of like protocol controlled liquidity except it's it's fed controlled liquidity right and then mm -hmm. uh they obviously uh have a lot of balance sheet assets of mortgage-backed securities right which are basically loans right they they're collateralized with a lot of uh loans that are uh debt originated against like U.S. property and, and mm -hmm. things like that, right? So it's uh, someone alluded to it being like, you can't be the decentralized Fed if you don't have all the tools and levers of the Fed, right? And so the Trinity is basically every uh, lever and tool that a central bank would have um, in its, you know, local economy. And I think that's a cool way to say it, right? Um, mm -hmm. You need all three of these things to actually be a, you know, a, the ability to conduct central banking in, in any local economy. If you're just a stable coin and you're only able to issue, you know, stable coins and people go do something with them, but you're kind of powerless to do anything else, right? If you're just a lending market, um, as, you know, Ave uh, realized succinctly that you cannot mint your own currency, you have to pay people to be uh, lenders and originate uh, people coming to your lending market to give them, you know, your stable coins. You can't create a stable coin unless you have one, right? Mm -hmm. So they realize that they need a stable coin, right? And uh, with, with Curve, they realize that, okay, we have a lot of liquidity. People are able to swap against stable coins and, you know, even volatile assets and stuff, but um, we can't capture any signage or any kind of uh, rehypothecation of this liquidity, right? And so without that, uh, they're like, we need a stable point, right? Instead of basically having liquidity uh, against every other uh, projects of stable coins, we just create one of our own. And so I think that this is the right way to think about uh, how to capture the entire financial stack. You you mentioned that, you know, that 
this is pretty much modeling after a central bank, but obviously this is not a central bank. In fact, there are many central banks in the space. It's hard to call it a central bank when you know there's there's frax, there's there's curve, there's everyone doing uh or heading towards the same goal. And obviously one of the biggest uh issues or challenges in the space are I'm gonna say again, it's regulations, right? And you know, I think the biggest thing over the last two, three weeks was the US sanctions on Tornado Cash. And they they kind of revived an under, under discussed issue of the space, which is actually censorship, right? You know, for the longest time people have been talking about, oh, you know, this centralized collateral, people can sanction it. Uh, USDC, they can sanction because they actually have control over their currency. They can blacklist whoever uses it. And in fact, this is what have happened, right? Uh, USDC, in fact, black blacklisted uh, Tornado Cash associated collateral, uh, associated USDC. So seeing as Frax relies on USDC as its primary form of collateral, you know, how has this impacted uh, your vision for the protocol or even your model? Yeah, it's a it's a great question because um, the I think the tornado cash stuff caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, and of whether it gets you know overruled in the U.S. Uh, judicial system or not, it was actually um, really important for everyone in the industry to have that conversation. So there's two types of things that I want to highlight uh, before talking about the kind of USDC uh, exposure, and one of them is that. Uh, the most important thing, in, in my opinion, is being able to both survive being, you know, sanctioned, but also not being sanctioned itself. Like this, people kind of forget this because like, uh, sure, Tornado Cash is probably one of the most decentralized uh, projects on Ethereum, right? And its contracts still exist, but almost no one can reasonably use it anymore. Right, because they mm -hmm. don't want to actually run afoul of of like U.S. sanctions. It's not useful for me. It's not useful for most people I know. Right, and the you know anonymity set and the utility you get for using it is tiny now. Right, um, and it still exists. Sure, it survives sort of technically. Right, but yep. the the point is that you should avoid being sanctioned, but also you should be resilient and survive if you are sanctioned so that the mm -hmm. fact that you can survive actually makes it so that you do not get sanctioned. If you get sanctioned, it's just, I, I usually like to stress it, it's just as stupid, right? Like it's, it's just as useless. Like even for example, let's take uh, LUSD, right? Like uh, the one that's only backed as stable coin, only backed by ETH, right? If mm -hmm. LUSD was, was sanctioned, uh yeah it, it survives probably right like the smart contracts still work i can't use it most people can't use it i don't think uh you know like you won't be able to lend it on compound you won't be able to uh you know use it as collateral for most places and stuff it's basically uh socially useless right yep and so the the thing is what you want to do is you want to be able to survive sanctions, but use the ability to survive the sanctions to actually not get sanctioned or, or basically not become a, uh, you know, a target. basically, <laughs> exactly, right? And be useful enough to most uh, common, normal, law-abiding people that if it's actually sanctioned, that there will be so much uproar and there will be so much defensive of your useful protocol that hopefully it'll get desanctioned or won't get sanctioned in the first place, right? The issue with Tornado Cash is it's, it was extremely useful for a lot of people, right? But the issue is now that's so divisive is that it, it's also useful for uh, all of the hacks and, and laundering from you know black hat hacking and stuff. Now, the thing with Tornado Cash was it, it was so messed up that you you can't just sanction open source code, right? It, it's essentially yep. like, sanctioning uh, free speech. So overall, I, I was really shocked about it. Now, to the question about like USDC, yeah, I think the this is this is a common uh, concern that's that's rightfully so. So both uh, maker DAO's DAI stablecoin and Frax hold a uh, significant 
portion of collateral on chain uh, in USDC or, or some fiat coins. Uh, sometimes it's actually a lot, admittedly. Like if you look at MakerDAO right now, over 82% of all DAI is collateralized by USDC. So it's, it's actually 82% uh, of every DAI in existence is uh, collateralized by one USDC, which is, it seems actually uh, kind of crazy, right? Yeah. And Frax also does have a USDC uh, exposure. I don't think it has it nearly as much, but one of the things that Frax does is that it deploys USDC and other collateral to different DEXs, right? Like on Curve, on, on Uniswap, and on FraxSwap as well. And in order for Frax to actually uh, get blacklisted and have its you know, USDC be inaccessible, you, uh, Circle has to actually blacklist Curve. It has to blacklist Uniswap. It has to blacklist those individual pair contracts that other people are LPing in, that other people are swapping in, other people are staking in those. And while that's technically possible, um, it is a different trust model than, for example, MakerDAO holding it in just a smart contract that they control, which um, you know Circle can surgically strike, right? And and, and yep. blacklist those kinds of things. For example, if for Frax to lose all of its USDC, Circle would have to blacklist the Frax BP curve pool, uh, all of the Frax USDC Uniswap pools. And if it does that, admittedly, it would be very bad. So they're not in any way uh, discounting that. However, what they would do also is they would brick those pools and essentially make it so that all of the fracks in those pools are actually inaccessible and inswappable, which even though that's bad, it actually makes it so that there's less fracks uh in the open market that users can pull out to, to redeem from the protocol. So it's actually an interesting thing because changing the, the place where the protocol holds USDC makes it so that it becomes far more costly for Circle to actually, or any you know, fiat coin issuer to actually blacklist uh, Frax. And if MakerDAO does this, obviously, if they deploy their USDC to Curve and Uniswap, um, which I think they might uh, a little bit to Uniswap, but they mostly hold it uh, themselves. But if they predominantly move it around, then it becomes very difficult to actually blacklist MakerDAO as, as well. Um, now, with that said, ideally, uh, there wouldn't be very much if any USDC or fiat coin collateral exposure. And so we go back to the whole stablecoin trilemma, which is yep. in order for uh, a stablecoin to have very good peg right? Never breaking its peg and also being able to have uh, elastic money supply, right? To increase the money supply to, to meet demand. Um, it seems like the last thing it has to give up is a complete decentralized collateral, some exposure to real dollars, if that's what that's what its peg is. And so it's not a coincidence that uh, Frax and DAI are the two largest on-chain stable coins by far. In fact, if you add up uh, all other dollar peg stable coins and, and uh, you you combine them uh, all other on chain you know decentralized dollar peg stable mm -hmm. coins they would be smaller than frax or die uh, cumulative mm -hmm. like if you add them all up that that's how large the size of die and, and frax are we're the only ones over a billion and uh, die is like six seven billion right and yeah. all of the other stable coins that are on chain that you know out that they're entirely decentralized and collateral, all this stuff. They just demonstrate that they've done uh, the other side of the stablecoin trilemma, right? They've sacrificed uh, scalability for decentralized collateral on the peg, right? They hold a peg and they have decentralized collateral. They have very little uh, market cap because they're not able to expand the, the money supply easily. Now, there might be a you know completely new, uh, never before seen innovation that kind of breaks the stablecoin trilemma. Right. For example, Vitalik claims that sharding in proof of stake uh, and, and uh, essentially L2 rollups breaks the, uh, the the blockchain trilemma. Right. You're able to have high throughput decentralization and uh, the ability to basically have security. Right. Uh, and and mm -hmm. shared state. So that that's kind of the answer to the blockchain trilemma. Maybe there is 
an answer to the the, the stablecoin trilemma. I think the the answer will have to be something that's uh, similar to Frax Lend or lending on chain that's extremely malleable, right? The ability to originate debt in many different ways that isn't just over collateralized ETH or over collateralized uh, Bitcoin loans. And so mm -hmm. Frax Lend, for example, is our lending system that's uh, isolated pairwise lending. It's uh, different than what Aave currently is or, or Compound. And hopefully as Frax Lend grows, we're able to lower USDC reliance and fiat coin reliance. But I ha we haven't seen, you know, to be to be frank, we haven't seen any stablecoin project outright be able to break this uh, stablecoin trilemma. Perhaps someone will. Perhaps they're. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps Frax will. Perhaps MakerDAO will. We're in the best position to do it, right? With with all three uh, aspects of the trinity. But it goes to be seen. I'm confident that in the next year we'll have the least amount of fiat coin reliance with one of the largest amount of circulating supply, but we shall see. Last question for the day. You talk a lot about the stablecoin trilemma, but you know, underpinning it is also adoption, which I think is one of the biggest challenges for any stablecoin, because assuming you can create a, you know, a perfect stablecoin that embodies and addresses the trilemma, uh, there is still the point of adoption, right? You, you can't naturally expect everyone to just suddenly gravitate towards you. There's always market perception, market psychology. Uh, it's, it's like one of the big reasons why Terra, despite its flaws, was so successful and they had over 20 billion worth of market cap because of the perception of its usefulness and reliability of its model. So... My my question to you is, you know, why why use Frax over other stable coins in the space, or why why pick this stable coin over any other stable coin in the space? When in crypto, it's not like a normal country where, okay, I go to this country, I have to use this currency. Uh, in crypto, more often than not, this currency is this place accepts more than one type of currency. Yeah, uh, well, was Terra used for the, the reliability of its model? I I mean the. I, I would argue that it was used because they paid everyone 20% yield, right? And and that didn't exactly. go over well. <laughs> so, um, so I think that just highlights that there's no easy way to grow adoption. You either have to pay people, which is unsustainable, or you have to genuinely have something that's unique, useful, and uh, safe, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so the thing we're trying to do with Frax is that like I said, if we can, you know, solve the stablecoin trilemma, that is actually something that's that's useful, right? Uh, that's actually something that is non-custodial. It's stable, and there's there's no risk of blacklisting, and it's fully uh, entirely yours if you own it, right? And so, if if we could do that, there's clear clear value proposition over USDC and and Tether and, and things like that, right? And um, I think that that's one of the main things to do. However, um, if if basically what you want is, and I think what users want is something that's actually safe in terms of the peg, like we've never broken our peg, something like USDC, which is safe in terms of the peg, but also something that is used and, and able to get you yield in places on chain, right? Not something mm -hmm. crazy, not something like, you know, 20% that it's not paid sustainable. Out. Yeah. The, like, uh, you know, token inflation or, or, or printing more uh, stable coins, but something that's actually useful and actually can act as an on-chain savings account or, or like yield system. That's also one thing that we're trying to make sure Frax is used in as many uh, DAOs, on-chain protocols and, used in as many liquidity pools and, and things like that. And you'll, you'll actually see, I think, Frax is one of the best uh, yielding stable coins, not in like a crazy degen way or some kind of like, <laughs> uh, you know, guaranteed 20% uh, system, but it's one of the best places to stake on Curve, on Convex, on our own mm -hmm. gauge system that you can check out on your know, app, frax.finance slash staking. Um, you can see how... A lot of people use Frax and and uh, are you know 
associated LP pools and gauge rewards and stuff for uh, passive, but also very reliable yield. And that eventually will have a lot of uh, Lindy effect, right? And that's, I think, something that will pay dividends in the next year or two. All right. I think uh, that's all I have to talk about today, Sam. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a great talk. Yeah, it's great having, having uh, being on. Thanks for having me.